speaker. Okay. So um yes, I don't see any questions on the chat, but oh. I was going to uh make a comment on um and I'd like to have your opinion on this. Um yesterday and all the other times during meditation, you always give this advice of taking a long in-breath and out-breath. Yeah. And uh, what we know from science is that when you take long exhales, it actually uh, puts pressure on the heart. And this sends a signal to the brain to slow down the heart. But when you take long inhales, it does the opposite. So this would mean that for meditation, one should take longer exhales than one takes inhales. Do you, do you agree with that? That the exhale should be longer than the inhale in order to slow down the heart and calm the mind. You know, my experience and I check my blood pressure uh, after uh, the way I explain. Uh, you take you long inhaling and long exhaling all the way, all the time. If I do it five minutes, and then check my blood pressure, I found the pressure is quite low. And therefore, from this experience, I tell people, take a deep inhaling and make deep exhaling until all the air in your lungs is gone. So each time you do this, you will get lung full of oxygen and you empty that air when you breathe out long. So that uh, when you breathe out every air, all air in your lungs, during that long exhaling, certain amount of carbon dioxide builds up, which dilates the arteries and veins. And then if you breathe in, take a long inhaling, you will get lung full of oxygen, which goes through these dilated arteries throughout the body. That is what I studied, I read uh, somewhere. And that is that may be what is happening mm -hmm. when I do this exercise, when I breathe like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bhante. Okay. Um, I don't see another question in the chat. So maybe I'll start the conversation regarding to your Tama talk from yesterday. Very about, good. About um, sensual pleasures. And... Um, it seems to me like one can be actually too rigid about rejecting sensual pleasures that one has to know where to draw the line. Okay. For example, you yourself, you went to museums in, um, in Italy and you visited many beautiful places and that is um, looking at beautiful art is a form of sensual pleasure but not necessarily an indulgence. How does one know not to be too uptight about this? Okay. Now, when you talk about sensual pleasure, uh, anything that pleases your senses and then that arouses your desire is not productive or uh, not uh, supporting uh, our spiritual growth. Any desire of any kind yeah, 
I remember reading a Buddhist story. One day, a monk smelled a flower. Then, this is a story, he smelled a flower. Then a deity came that this monk was a thief. Then the monk said, well, I did not touch the flower. I did not pick the flower. I let the flower be on the tree. It is so beautiful, full of fragrance. I simply smell the fragrance. Then the deity said, that is the stealing. If, if a lay person did that, that's okay. Because lay person, many lay people generally have desire for smell, taste, touch, and so forth. You are a monk, an arahant, and you are not supposed to have this kind of pleasure, which may ordinary people have, but you should not have it. See the subtlety of desire, subtlety of desire, and therefore, uh, you, you know, ordinarily uh, appreciating beautiful piece of art in museums, ancient things, rocks, so many beautiful things. Uh, therefore, this is a very innocent kind of appreciation. But that would uh, dissuade, that would uh, take away your real, deep, equanimous mental state, equanimity. Therefore, in the, when we talk about, of course, people, ordinary people cannot go to that extent. But uh, this is called, called going against the current. Uh, anusha, patisota gami. My discourse yesterday was Anusota Sutta. Anusota means going with the current, going with the grain, going with the air. Uh, this is going against the current. And therefore, these are the two, you, you can draw the very sharp line between these two. Uh, there is no you know, nebulity, nebulous uh, state, unclear, uh, in, you know, inconspicuous uh, state there, a line there. Things is very clear. Uh, so the difference between ordinary person's mentality and the enlightened person's mental mentality uh, is very, very clear. Uh, in order to show that, that discourse uh, uh, I used yesterday, uh, one who crossed over the five kind of floods, four kinds of flowers, Kamoga, Bhavoga, Dittoga, Avijoga. Oga means floods. Kamoga uh, desire, uh, sensual pleasure, desire is so subtle. Uh, I'll tell you another example. <laughs> Suppose I like to eat certain kind of food, and I hear another person says, that person does not like it to eat that kind of food. Then, in my mind, arise some uh, little discomfort, uncomfortable feeling. Gee, I like this food, why doesn't he like this food? That means I wish what I like, others also to like. <laughs> it doesn't happen. But the subtle desire is there, the music that I like to hear, I want everybody to like that music. It doesn't happen that way. But when I like certain music, 
and others don't like that music, then there will be some disappointment in my mind. Because I like everybody to like what I like. Therefore, this, uh, you know, this is very subtle uh, desire. This is what Buddha said in uh, uh, Satipattana Sutta and so forth, in, uh, when he explained uh, uh, not to get what one wants is suffering. I want that person to listen to the music that I like, but he doesn't listen to it. He would he would do something and he would listen to, listen to he would be uh, listening to something else. So he doesn't like music at all. So therefore, when the others don't like what I like, there arise certain amount of desire. A disappointment, a resentment. Why? Because the desire is so subtle, I want everybody to like what I like. You know, that, that is how the, the Anusotagami, I want to go along with the current and I want everybody else to go along with the current. You see? Mm -hmm. I hope others also have questions. Yes, Bhante, we just uh, we have some. Uh, is chanted chanting considered a ritual? Like when you when we do chanting, is it considered to be a ritual? Uh, what the person wants to know. When we do when we do some chanting, sometimes we do some chanting before meditation. Is that considered to be one of the rituals? Is that considered a ritual? Well, that depends on what you chant, what you recite. If you recite the qualities of the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, that is a reminder of uh, the attributes of the Buddha, which is uh, what you call a part of meditation. It is called uh, anusati, reflection or remembering the qualities of the Buddha Dhamma Sangha is a part of meditation. Anusati bhavana. That is not a ritual. And that definitely is, that definitely helps us to uh, gain concentration develop our wisdom and to understand the depth of the Buddha's uh, wisdom, enlightenment, and the purity of Dhamma and purity of noble disciples, Aryan disciples, those who are in, from Sotapanna to Arantur, they are called Aryan disciples. They are purity, Dhamma's purity, Buddha's purity and wisdom, all these are uh, support, the supporting factors for the practice of meditation. Therefore, they are not rituals. But if we recite something uh, not you know, directly uh, pertaining to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, uh, just for, it sounds beautiful, uh, and thinking that it will bring us bring us merits and that merits will help us to attain liberation, that's a ritual. So what it depends on what you chant. Okay. Thank you, Bhante. The next question is again about meditation in breathing. If we keep taking deep in and out breath and we maintain this all the time. At what point can we attain the jhanas? Okay. That's also a good question. <laughs> because when you take deep breath, inhaling and exhaling, your mind becomes calm, relaxed, and peaceful. Your hindrances will not invade your mind. Uh, Hindrances, the moment hindrances 
totally subsided from your mind, that moment you attain jhana, the first jhana, and you will be fully aware of that first jhana. You may have at that time very beautiful thoughts of letting go of desire. You will have a very beautiful thoughts of loving friendliness, metta feeling. You will have a compassionate feeling. These are not verbalized metta, karuna, mudita, and so forth. Not verbalized, but the feeling, feeling. Uh, you will have then the mind is calm, relaxed, peaceful, free from hindrances. Then you gain concentration. That is you. The, that is the way you gain concentration. Thank you, Bhante. The next question is: uh, How do you, uh, how to not cling to objects arising through the five senses? and the mind. Um, so how do we not cling through the five senses uh, and, and the mind? And then how do we stop mental proliferation in daily life? OK. It is not ordinarily easy for somebody to uh, prevent mental proliferation from arising. It is not very easy. Uh, in ordinary life while you are walking, talking, and so on. You can do this particularly during the time you meditate. Uh, other times, uh, it is difficult. It Difficult doesn't mean impossible, but difficult. And therefore, one who has trained the mind, trained the mind to prevent or stop uh, proliferation, mental proliferation, then it becomes naturally easy. Mental proliferation arises as uh, uh, Madhu Pindika Sutta explained. Uh, we have senses, ICS, no sense of earth, and sensory object. When these two come to the consciousness arises, then feeling arises, contact arises, then feeling arises, when feeling arises, perception arises, when perception arises, we think about it. Uh, and when we think about it, that is the time mental proliferation start. And then the person will be carried away by the mental proliferation through the eyes, to ears, and so forth, through the senses. And therefore, if one sees this procedure, this process from uh, eyes and visual objects coming together and so on, in meditation, and if we keep training ourselves uh, in that practice, again and again and again, then in ordinary life, in day-to-day -day life, when you are involved in certain things, as soon as the mental proliferation begins, you can detect it and then nip in the bud. If you have not trained yourself during meditation, then we'll, that will uh, Happen that proliferation will happen uh, very easily, and you will be, uh, you know, you will be uh, carried away. Uh, you will be suppressed by the proliferation. Okay. Thank you, Bante. Um, yesterday, you talked um, about the asawas. You talked about the influxes. Would you please elaborate more on the anusayas, the underlying tendencies? How are they different from the asawas? Okay. Anusaya is, uh, uh, is what underlying tendencies. Uh, for example, we can say, suppose you sit in certain place. 
sitting, sitting, sitting uh, on a chair or floor or wherever. And when you sit, your uh, heat would uh, radiate into the seat and see it becomes warm. When you get up, still the, uh, the heat will remain on the seat for some, for some times. Even when you get up, heat will, the seat will remain warm for a few um, seconds. That is like Anusaya. Anusaya. When the major defilements are over, their residues will remain. Those residues co are called anusaya. And the, sometimes even arahant who have uh, overcome their asavas may still have some anusayas. For example, there was uh, one monk called Filin the Watcher and Arahant, Arahant, fully enlightened Arahant, overcome all defilements. But he used to address people using uh, certain low, uh, the words used for low caste. In India, there were, as you all know, there was a caste system. In the rest of the world, especially West, you have a class system, class differentiation. India had or still have caste distinction. That is the Brahmin caste, uh, uh, that means ruler, advisor class, ruler class, khatya, and uh, merchant's class, and uh, workers class. So the below workers class, there was another class which is called untouchables, untouchables. And the Pali word is vasala. Pali word is vasala. Vasala is used for the untouchables. Lowest class, they don't even belong to the four major classes. Castes. So this monk called Pilin the Watcher called people Vasala. Whenever he met anybody, he would call Vasala, come and sit. Vasala, where are you going? Vasala, how are you? Vasala means lowest, untouchable caste. So this was a, sort of a um, irritation to people. They went and complained to the Buddha. And Buddha said, well, this monk has been a Brahmin in 500 consecutive lives. And he still has this mentality, Brahmin's mentality. That is his Anusaya. His Anusaya remains and therefore still he used this word. It is just like uh, after getting rid of all defilements, this residues still was in his mind. The one who did not have any anusaya was the Buddha. He did not have even anusaya. So, uh, and also Buddha, when he uh, met people, he would be able to tell this, these people remaining Anusaya and Asava, how much they have destroyed Asava, how much they still have, and uh, what Anusaya, uh, how Anusaya gets rid of it. He get, can get, get rid of Anusaya. And so forth, uh, this is the difference between Asava and Anusaya. Okay. Thank you, Bante. The next question is how to differentiate between sensual pleasure and PT, the experience of PT that we may have in meditation. Right. 
so sensual pleasure and pity uh, one is uh, sam is a sukha other is niram is a sukha or sam is a pity and niram is a pity sam is a pity means the pleasure uh, with desire any pleasure with desire is called sam is a pity niram is a pity niram is a pleasure i mean you use the word pleasure uh, just for the sake of discussion it is much uh, subtler than uh, ordinary pleasure niram is a pity uh, is developing by letting go of all the sensual pleasures uh, all the uh, enjoyment and uh, pleasure with desire uh, is gone and when it when that desire is gone you have a pleasure which is called niram is a pleasure Se- not non sensual pleasure for instance when uh, somebody who has not attained even the first level of enlightenment will enjoy seeing things as you mentioned the seeing art uh, pieces of art and so on uh, also ordinary person can understand impermanence impermanence in ordinary person mind every impermanent thing is unsatisfactory every unsatisfactory is selflessness and but he cannot go beyond that he gets stuck there but the one who attain enlightenment when that person sees everything is impermanent uh then the person will not have uh, uh, suffering every impermanent thing is suffering but for enlightened person every impermanent thing is not suffering every impermanent thing for him gives him a pleasure because whatever that person experiences is disappearing impermanent so the mind will be always in a uh, peaceful state peaceful state and therefore uh, even though the same object is watched by two unenlightened person and the enlightened person unenlightened person sees impermanence and then unsatisfaction and selflessness and then get stuck there but the enlightened person sees impermanence and not uh, getting involved in this pain suffering and he sees sees everything all the aggregates are impermanent all the material things are impermanent therefore there is nothing to change his realization that gives him a pleasure so <clears throat> therefore uh, the ups and downs he walks charanti visame samam he moves around with uh, on the path which has dips and bumps dips and bumps doesn't make his attitude feeling different whether it is dips or bumps high or low he remains equanimous that is why in uh, uh, mangala sutra last stanza says uttrasya loka dhamme chittam yasna kampati asokam virajam 
ஏமாங் ஏதா மங்கள முத்துமா when he meets with worldly nature worldly vicissitudes worldly states putas lokadham lokadham is worldly state rise and fall gain and loss uh, pleasure and pain and so forth famous fame and the fame and all this uh, other normal things in the world in any world anywhere so the enlightened person mind is so steady so calm so peaceful equanimous that the mind that that person's mind remains calm relaxed peaceful all the time is called charanti visame samam ups and downs is all for that person does not create different ripples in my different thought waves now i can spend little more time for one more sh- short question uh, uh, we have some question. one advice question um what's the best um how to best spend our time in retirement uh should one take a hobby or something to focus the mind what's your advice for somebody that's about to enter retirement how should they occupy their time yeah, that's very good advice very good question i'm retired <laughs> <laughs> so i can i can give you very good advice <laughs> from my experience yes read the dhamma books read good dhamma books and whenever possible chant very good sutras in pali or in english in your mother tongue and then meditate meditate and do some physical exercise and sleep moderately eat moderately if you do these things your retirement is very meaningful <laughs> okay thank you vante all right i think this may be enough for today the questions and answers i see you all next week and come uh, to listen to another dhamma talk Okay friends now let us do meditation Okay Okay Thank <laughs> you.
Okay, you can see me. Yes, we can see you, Bante, but we can't um we can't see the slides. Ah, oh, here it's coming up. Yes, we can see it. Okay. May all beings be happy and secure. May all beings have happy minds. Whatever living beings there may be, without exception, weak or strong, long, large, medium, short, subtle or gross, visible or invisible, living near or far, born or coming to birth. May all beings have happy minds. Let no one deceive another, nor despise anyone anywhere, neither from anger nor ill will. Should anyone wish harm to another, as a mother wishes her own life to protect her only child, even so towards all living beings, one should cultivate a boundless heart. One should cultivate for all the world a heart of boundless loving friendliness above, below, and all around, and not tucked without hatred to resentment, whether standing, walking, sitting, lying down, or lying awake. One should develop this mindfulness. This is called divinely dwelling here, not falling into erroneous views, but virtuous and endowed with vision, removing the sign for sensual pleasures, one comes never again to birth in the womb. Okay. <clears throat> Once again with this method, meta thought, let us begin our meditation. I hope you all remember even during this, this discussion, uh, we mentioned uh, what we are supposed to do in meditation. So please remember them. And I try to stop talking so that we will have more time to meditate. As I mentioned yesterday, even after ringing the bell, if you like to continue your meditation, you may also do so. And I wish you very successful practice.
by means of this meritorious deeds, may I never join with the foolish, may I join always with the wise, until the time I attain the burner. May the suffering be free from suffering. May the fear struck be free from fear. May the grieving be free from grief. So too may all beings be. From the highest realm of existence to the lowest, may all beings perish in these realms, with form and without form, with perception and without perception, be released from all suffering and attain to perfect peace. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Dear friends, um, sir, I think this ends our today's session. And I'm glad that you all came. Let us share our metta with all living beings. First of all, I want to share metta with all those who are in hospitals, even homes suffering from various diseases, sicknesses, and taken care of by various compassionate doctors, nurses, hospital staff. May they recover very soon and find place, time to meditate and liberate themselves from samsaric suffering. May the doctors, nurses, hospital staff who take care of these people, risking their own lives, jeopardizing their comfort. May they find time to practice meditation, focus the mind on Dhamma, and liberate themselves also from samsaric suffering. All those who have lost their loved ones and grieving, may they be free from grief, find time, place, moment to meditate, and may they also be free from all kind of samsaric suffering. May all others who are in various places, in trouble spots, war zones, discrimination, poverty-stricken area, and may all of them Find time, place, moment to practice meditation and understand the nature of Dhamma and find peace, practice meditation and liberate from samsaric suffering. May all those whose categories I have not mentioned, all of them, all over the universe, in all ten directions, be well, happy, and peaceful, and liberate from samsaric suffering. Okay, so that is the end of today's session, and see you next week. Thank Sir. you, Bhante. Everyone, Sarnai, Bhante. Everyone, Sarnai. Thank you, Bhante. Deva, Bhante. Sad, sad, sad. Yeah, uh, thank you.